If, if you've ever had a buddy that uh, goes to Las Vegas and he's your friend that won't leave the table. Uh -huh. So you have a great run and everybody's made money and everybody gets up and he's the one who sits there and goes, now I got him where I want him. Right. I'm gonna double and you come back at six in the morning and he's still sitting there. Crying. And he's still got some <laughs> chips in front of him. You go, well, you still got some chips. Oh, I've been to the ATM five times. And it, if you're gonna go all in every time, eventually you're gonna get killed. Yeah. You're listening to Business Lunch with Roland Frazier. This is your seat at the table. Hey everybody, Roland Frazier here, and uh, I am excited about this business lunch because we have a unique business model and a unique human being uh, that, uh, that I'm happy to, to say I've had the opportunity to spend some time with, Jeff Hayes, with uh, Jeff Hayes Films and Revealed Films. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you, glad to be here. Thank you for, thank you for taking the time. So um, let's start by just you do a really cool thing that um, that I think a lot of people aren't familiar with as a business model. Do you mind talking a little bit about what you do and kind of how it works? Yeah, so I do docu-series. I um, was doing documentary films in 2005. I was shortlisted for an Academy Award in traditional documentary. And the it went on and, and started doing some documentary films that we tried to sell online mm -hmm. and failed miserably. And I had one in 2013 called Bought, and we um, put it on a pay platform, uh, had more affiliates than they'd ever had, and it still it still failed. It made I spent seven hundred thousand making it. We made back sixty thousand mm -hmm. after six weeks, and it was dead. And so I waited a few months and I released it online on my own website for free. And people could view it. It was in kind of a Jeff Walker launch format. It was free for 10 days, had this limited period. And I built a quarter of a million name email list from people registering to see it. Now, did, was that having affiliates and stuff as well? Yeah, that, so that, that was with affiliates. Okay. And it, and so people, other people were out there saying you should go see this. Go see, and it's right. a small offer, it's a small ask. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, go watch this go for watch free. This free thing. And so I built a quarter million name list that still, um, now six years later, is still paying off every month like a broken slot machine. Nice. It, 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 so I didn't know what I was doing, but I built a list. And then we ended up selling a quarter of a million dollars worth of the documentary that we were giving away for free. Mm -hmm. Will you and explain for people that are listening why anyone Why would, would anybody? Yeah. Well, you know, so the, uh, it's, um, and, and we amplify this, so this is key. But once you start that engagement, there's two things that happen. One, people don't have time to watch the whole thing, and it's valuable, they like it, and they want to own it. But the other thing is we're investing in them. We're putting it out there, and a lot of them just want to support the message. They want to put it in their library. Like, I sell hundreds of thousands of DVDs every year. Mm -hmm. I don't even know where my DVD player is. Yeah, right. I mean, it's like, you know, who are... But you but, know what? Netflix still makes, at last I heard, 25% of their revenue from DVD rental. Uh, so mail, it, the mail. Thing. Yeah, it's yeah. like, so I don't know who these people are, but mm -hmm. apparently they're my customers. Um, so the next evolution of the model, it, the problem with a documentary is you can charge twenty four ninety five, maybe thirty nine ninety five for a single documentary. So this evolved into the docu-series. And what we did is we took my film bought and unedited it. And this is basically took all the talent out of it, the stuff I and worked what is, a year. what is bought about? And so it was about big pharma and GMOs and, okay. and, and our food supply being okay. bought. So, so a cause that people care about. It was something that a lot that, of people care about. Right, so this was the tagline of Jeff Hayes Films. It, it was uh, movies that make movements. And mm -hmm. so we tap into the energy of that crowd and so we put one together, and instead of it being a, a same episode for 10 days, it was 10 days with two hours of content each night. And I basically showed the raw interview, where if I go film somebody, I may film two hours, mm -hmm. but then use 90 seconds. This, mm -hmm. we showed the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And amazingly enough, it, it's, it was heartbreaking. I got a call on the eighth day from a friend saying, Jeff, this is the best thing you've ever done. And again, I took all the talent, you know, 
the editing's gone, the music bed is gone, all the B-roll is gone, it's just the raw right. information. So what do you mean that's the best it's thing the best, It's like, oh, it's heartbreaking. Right. But people loved it. We did about two million in sales on and the again, first one. And again, you were showing for free for 10 showing days. Showing for free. And then you offer people the ability to buy it. How much do they, is the price for, for have buying? price points from 79 to 279. That's pretty expensive for a, and, for a film, right? And it's, and, well, and it's 20 hours, and then we put together printed books if so they, they buy the, the physical. So they get the uh, back interviews as well in that Right, case. so they get the whole series plus bonus footage and 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 stuff that's related to the series. And 79 to how much? 79 to 279. Okay, and what's the difference between the prices? So digital, all digital okay. versus physical with everything. And our average price point is right at 200, so okay. that's what normal, uh, normally it will do. So we did a couple of those, and each one of them turned out to be a seven-figure launch. Uh, now I've done uh, about eight of them. I've got six in production right now. And the, it's built on a paradox. The more we give away, the more money we make. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, at the end of the series, after it's run, it goes dark. We go live again that weekend and do a replay weekend where people can go and watch all of them. And but who can really watch twenty hours of yeah, or internet to, video right? on a, on a weekend? But it's there. They can so you do it. like a marathon during the weekend. Yep. Yeah, and then that is one of our biggest sales days. Nice. So it's it, it's all based on um, the more we give away, the more money we make. That's really cool. And um, so the it, what is a viewer worth? Like like a a free viewer? How many free viewers turn into uh, somebody that spends two hundred dollars on average? So about eight percent buy. Really, that's great. And then, but th that email list um, has a value on its own. So in our health list, we've done a lot of health topics. Then we put them into marketing on health, and now we're starting to focus on money and finance mm -hmm. and entrepreneurship. And those leads on the back end are ten times as valuable because people can see a clear ROI. Um, like we did Money Revealed and Robert Kiyosaki was in that series and we're never selling anything during the series. So at the end of that series, a week later, uh, we mailed that list and I think it did a million two in Robert Kiyosaki sales nice. in 10 days That's great. because the people were introduced to him in the series in a no pressure mm -hmm. situation. So That's really cool. We like it. <laughs> now, and uh, what kind of revenues are you guys doing, do you, like, say, in, in for 19, if you don't mind saying? I'll do 8 million. Yeah, my partner and I will do 8 million this Off year. of 8 films, right? Off of no um, less than 8. So I think we're releasing 4 this year. 4, okay. Great. Yeah, and what I was excited to share with you, we got Wine Reveal coming out. I know, And I'm this excited. one, I have no clue if it'll make money. That's what I was wondering, because I, it's not as, well, I mean, I guess if you did, like, Wine fillers and things like that. Is it a controversially kind of one or different? so? No, it's uh, so we're um, it, it's just a uh, indulgence of Patrick's and my love of wine. And again, we were able to drink wine tax deductibly for yeah, a year. Yeah, that's all right, right. And so it, it's one that we're doing out of passion. Um, he thinks it's going to do great. I have concern, and we'll see. Uh, either way, it, it was a blast to do. Nice. Yeah, I think you brought the. Uh, Domain de Romani Conti, was it a Latash? To, yes. Uh, Beverly Hills, and we had that. So I feel like I participated in the research of that. Yeah, one, it, of there's that, been a lot of research this yes, year. Yes, yeah. I like that. <laughs> so um, how, how did, I, I have lots of questions, and I'll decide what to do first. Um, I, I want to ask this one first. If, if somebody wanted to do a documentary or a docuseries, how would like what makes a good one? That's that's probably the, the better thing to ask first. What what do you look for, and what should somebody who says, "Gosh, this is really cool. I had no idea you could do this." Um, what do you, what do you look for? What are the elements of a successful? So series? generally, the person that's having that idea shouldn't, mm -hmm. um, because oftentimes people, oh, I want to do a documentary about what I'm doing. I want to do a docu series about what I'm doing. And they're automatically on the wrong side of the equation in that they want it to be about them, and that's called an infomercial. And so what makes us work is I go and interview great experts on topics that I'm interested in that I'm not um, 
I don't have anything to promote in that arena. So, pe so I'm more trustworthy. People know I'm not Robert Kiyosaki. I'm not one of these guys w with products to sell. Mm -hmm. So they tend, like when I did one on stem cells, I literally had the world's best experts on stem cells, but what our customer service was inundated with is people that wanted to know where did I choose to get my stem cells. So I'm a high school dropout, certainly no medical, mm -hmm. you know, why would they care? But they think I'm more trusted because they know I've seen it all right. and I could choose. So step one is to really get your head on right about it. This is not, if you want to do something like this to promote yourself, be in someone else's docu-series. So if you clear that hurdle and it's like, okay, there's something, we have about nine criteria that we do a weighted average on the nine criteria, um, but we like polarity. We like to take a stand, even if it's an unpopular stand. Um, that way I'm looking for something that grows under someone else's energy, not under my energy. So when we did GMOs Revealed, there were millions of people that were really aggressively yeah. into this issue. And yeah. so it's their energy that I want to tap into. Sure. Uh, I also know I'm going to have to spend about a year with the topic. And so is it something that I'm passionate about? Am I willing to live with this for a year? Then, you know, some simple things like, do I have access to the market? Can I find the people? Right. Um, and, you know, it, it can't just be there's this incredible cactus in southern Utah that's been there for 500 years. People would like, well, no, <laughs> nobody right. wants to, you know. Right. So, it, it, you know, is there an audience for it? Is, it? is it underserved? And can I access them? And then what's become one of our biggest criteria, is there a logical back end on the product? So mm -hmm. when we first started doing this, G we were doing them out of passion and GMOs revealed, um, the logical back end for that is what? It, it doesn't really exist. You know, well, you bought GMOs revealed, you're gonna want this particular vitamin is kind of a, a big bridge to cross. So <laughs> now we do them knowing that there's a logical back end because that's become the most valuable part of the business. And what that means is that you sell, you show the thing for free, you do the replay for free, and then people have the op option of buying the 79 to 279, I think it was, right? Right. Uh, product, which is the actual documentary. Right. But you've also built a list of people that then you make offers to. And that, that tail, that list, uh, if done right, should be five to ten times as valuable as sure. launching the series. Yeah. And when, how long have you been doing it? When did you do your first one? Uh, so in, in this model? In this model, uh, I think uh, this is our third or fourth year. And how is the list from the very first one? Is that the 250,000 list? So that goes back to the 2013. Okay. So now our, our list combined are about a million two. Uh -huh. and, how's, and So how's the older, I'm wondering if there's a, because I found that like if you do a launchy kind of thing, that list usually has, you know, a couple year life. The, but you've got passionate people, so this it's a lot This longer. one, my first list is still generating um, a ton of, Mike Geary manages that list uh -huh. for me. I don't do anything with it. it. And he is still, it is paying off. And we, like, we can't explain why six <laughs> years later, but I think it was because of the passionate group that we built in that. The other thing that the docu-series model does, and I see this when we mail for other affiliates, where we'll have some of these guys who build lists with eBooks or it's not that much engagement. Right. And so they're not really in the boat. By the time somebody goes through a docu-series, they're, they're involved with it. Well, you're telling an emotional story, right? When right. That. Yeah. So that, that's so, really cool. So it's a great way if you already had a list to re-engage them. Absolutely. Right? So now when did, when, when was your first entrepreneurial, endeavor? So I, my first entrepreneurial endeavor, endeavor is when I discovered the difference between gross and net. And I was uh, eight or nine and I signed up to sell seeds out of the back of Boys Life magazine. Okay. And I went and sold seeds all over our neighborhood. Door to door basically. Door right? to door. Yeah. And, and uh, 
and spent the money as quickly as it came in. <laughs> and then my dad had to pay for the seats. <laughs> and this is my first entrepreneurial lesson of the difference between gross and net, right, because right. it felt like Those my money. costs. <laughs> that, so th- this was, uh, um, at one time I was speaking at uh, the University of Utah to their MBA, my, M, uh, MBA class. And somebody asked, can you teach entrepreneurship? And my belief is, yes, as long as you're teaching it to an entrepreneur. <laughs> There's a different kind of brain, and it's a dangerous brain. Our prisons are filled with entrepreneurial brains uh-huh. because one of our beliefs is that the rules don't apply to us. Right. And if you don't have some ethics and morals, if you don't have some guardrails, it can turn ugly uh-huh. uh, pretty fast. And so I, I think that entrepreneurs are different we know who we are, but there's a difference between an entrepreneur and a business owner. I think anyone can own a business. Uh-huh. I think when you talk about entrepreneurship, looking out at something that's never been done and saying, well, I can do that. Uh-huh. Only a crazy person thinks that. <laughs> and we gather together uh, as crazy people and go, hey, we're not alone. That's right. There's you know, a lot of us that think this way. So you, you did the seeds and you had that that uh, takeaway, yes. <laughs> as, as it were. And then what, what, what happened after that? So the, from it, it, literally from that start, of course, it was paper routes and, and big paper routes when I was a kid to, um, at 18, I took a job selling encyclopedias door to door. I bought my first Cadillac at 18. Nice. It, it was so nice. It was repossessed nine months later. Uh-huh. The, uh, but it, it, you know, it, so my entrepreneurial journey, uh, th- then I, I had a company in Texas in my early 20s that sold water softeners, whole home treatment systems, and had five offices in Texas and um, about 100 salespeople. And I went up and down and created lots of damage um, had very high highs that I always thought were permanent right. and then devastating losses. Uh, by the time I was 31, I had a jet. And by the time I was 32, I was busted out. Didn't have the jet. <laughs> yeah, it was a, you know, I went worse than didn't, don't, doesn't have a jet anymore. Right. But it was, uh, my career was um, a lot of wreckage and a lot of knowledge that if I had known, if there had been masterminds, if there had there been gatherings, I could have skipped 90% of the damage. You think you would have listened to that, that version of yourself? The post-jet Jeff, yes. The yeah. pre-Jeff was bulletproof. Right, yeah. yeah. yeah but, we, all, we all have a bit of that, yeah. don't we? That's funny. So, uh, so let's talk about that then. What would post-jet Jeff, uh, but let's actually talk about Jeff now, uh, say to the Jeff back then. Well, the the key is if if you ever had a buddy that goes to Las Vegas, and he's your friend that won't leave the table, uh-huh. so you have a great run and everybody's made money and everybody gets up and he's the one who sits there and goes, now I got him where I want him. Right. I'm gonna double, and you come back at six in the morning and he's still sitting there, Crying. and he's still got <laughs> some chips in front of him. You go, well, you still got some chips. Oh, I've been to the ATM five times, and it. If you're gonna go all in every time eventually you're going to get killed. And I always believed in what I did. I was always the first investor and I was always willing to go all in. Right. And, um, you know, I mentioned Mike Gary. Mike has built tremendous wealth and will never put more than 5% into anything. Yeah, that's smart. And it's that, um, I thought somehow it was morally uh, required for me if I was going to ask other people to fund my projects to go all in myself, uh-huh. and it's a stupid way. I think to you be. also have a little go big, go home mentality when you're younger. You yes, know? and, and right. I, I'm almost cured of that. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I still have the, well, I have the impulse. Right. But, um, and I want to go big, but I don't have to go all in. So after you um, had the jet, lost the jet, um, then what did you do next? So that's when I got in the film business in the mid '90s. And did you have a film background or contacts in the film world, or? So I I had been an investment banker and I knew how to raise money. Okay. And if you you know, it, it's funny there were three of us that were stockbrokers, at in my late twenties. Uh, 
one of them read, um, and one of them, a guy named Jim Rennert, and me, and I, they asked, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to make movies. My friend Red said, I want to be a pilot. And my friend Jim Rennert says, I'm a sculptor. And amazingly enough, Red is now the, the chief pilot for Spirit Airways. Huh. Uh, I've been shortlisted for an Academy Award in film, and Jim Rennert is in the National Gallery of Art. I was just in New York two weeks ago, and I'm walking down the street, and I see this massive 15-foot-tall statue at a street installation, and it's my buddy Jim Renner on, cool. on the street. Nice. Uh, so the, 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 the lesson there is you can be anything you decide to be. So I but, know there's lots of people that would like to be in the movies, uh, not just stars, but right. doing kind of stuff like you're doing on production. So how, how, how did you do it? So the, because what allowed me to do that is I know how to raise money. Yeah. And so... If you and I decide we want to be in the software business, if you and I can raise money, we're in the software business. Mm -hmm. And so learning to access capital um, allows, you know, that doesn't mean you deserve the capital, right. but learning to access capital um, for me was the only reason I got to play in this arena. If you raise enough capital, then talent in the film business is readily available. Mm. Nice. Yeah, that you just have to call the agent and say, let's do it, right? Yeah, and, it's, and, and so then I developed, uh, I, uh, uh, my friend Roger Hamilton says, wealth is what you have left if you lose all your money. And he's not talking about where your mind goes at first, like, yes, you're right, my health, my family, you know, my son, this, you know, that's the, forget that. He's mm -hmm. talking about on a real practical level, wealth is the skills you have, the skills and experience and the relationships. Yeah. And so... I invest deeply in relationships. Yeah. And so, you know, I see you at different places. I'm a member of a lot of masterminds. I, I, I invest in relationships with no expectation of pulling things out of it, yeah. but that's where my contacts, that's where my, um, th th that's where that grows. And so I've done that in a lot of social different- Social capital. It's social capital. Yeah, I agree. That's really cool. So, um, so you decide you want to do, get movies. You raise some money to do it. Uh, was your first movie the very first one that you did, or did you have a couple no, so, learning experiences along the way? So I have always had to take the kind of ugly road. So the first thing we did in the 90s, I started Capstone Entertainment, and we started doing um, children's programming shot like TV shows that I built a telemarketing company that started with... Um, a woman who's now our, our director of marketing, Catherine Merritt, she started and had one employee who was my uh, sophomore in high school son. And they started calling on the phone, selling family entertainment over the phone. So basically direct, direct cold telemarketing. Cold telemarketing. Yeah. That ended up a year later, we had 300 employees. We did 10 million first year. Wow. Had a, a a uh, 196 station now, had predictive you done dialer. telemarketing before? No. And so how did you identify so, the people to do that? Uh, Catherine, I recruited her from uh, a company where she had done that very successfully, okay. uh, selling coaching and and. Uh, but from one employee to 300 in the first year. Um, but you got to admit that's you know you say well I'm in the film business. That's the ugly, hardworking end of the it film is. business at best. Right, right. But you're still selling entertainment. It's just <coughs> you don't have distribution. So you created distribution. Created my own distribution. And, and I've continued. Like, I've sold films to Lionsgate. I've sold a series to Jeffrey Katzenberg's new company. Yeah. I was at a dinner um, at last Sundance, and there were six of us at the table, and I was the only person at the table who hadn't won or been nominated for an Academy Award. And the topic of the conversation was, how are you making money doing what we're doing? Right. They, and are they making money? No, yeah, no, say, that's like, that, they, that, that, these guys. That art, art recognition thing is different from making money. Yeah, so yeah. this, they're like, so they're baffled by, wait a minute, you're doing what we're doing and we're starving to death. Mm -hmm. um, and we have more recognition. By, by far, so yeah. owning But that recognition comes from your peers who are a bunch of artists. Yeah, so it, and they're very happy. There's always somebody making money in the chain and yeah. finding out um, where the money is. And so it, and for us, it's distribution, even to the point 
um, where I've got a friend that is uh, on the board for the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, and she's on the Board of Governors, and she's on a committee called Future of Film. And they're a little bit like the music industry, seeing their their base erode, and, and all of a sudden new things are coming up that they don't know how to deal with. And they're looking at our model, because the, the big difference, but, you know, Sony, uh, you know, their worst hour is bigger than my best year, mm -hmm. but they don't know who their customers are. Those customers belong to somebody else. Yeah. So when the thing happened with North Korea uh, on the the the, the uh, um, film that North Korea wanted them to shut down, mm -hmm. had that happened to me, we just said we don't need the theaters when the theater owner. We'll release ourselves direct to our people. Yeah, yeah. But Sony is held captive yeah, to. There's a lot of power in that. Yep. Own your distribution, right? And so that's, for me, that's critical. That's really cool. So uh, you did this first film, uh, the first series of films was the children's films yeah. that you were selling telemarketing. And you don't do that now, so obviously you've evolved the model. What was the first evolution of the model? So, th so after that, I did about five more entrepreneurial ventures. Uh, I started a company called Pod Fitness that we lost 25 million in. It was brilliant. I started a company, Talk to Technology, that we raised 75 million and later sold it for 10 million. Um, and it you know, started a series of companies. And then. Now, uh, are, so would would it be fair to say that the five companies didn't really work out? It is it, it, spectacular. Okay. So, uh, fail failures. so failures, right? Yep. So now, how did you keep. Because I think a lot of people experience that. Um, how did you keep yourself motivated and fired up and feeling positive to do the next thing in uh, as you were experiencing that? By the time you had that fifth failure, you got to be going, hey, go on. This, it, it, well, uh, so a part of it, 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 and you really make a good point, a part of it I, you have to almost shield yourself from, like, I want to learn the lessons that I should have learned. Yeah. I want to learn, you know, I don't want to repeat these mistakes. Yeah. At the same time, there, you know, there's, there's a voice in the back of my head that says, you're injuring people, you're no good, you've done, you're, uh, and that, that voice has to be contained, the voice to really look at yourself harshly and say, okay, here's when I knew, here's when I should have done that. That's a positive process. The way I've kept my boat floating in the midst of a series of fairly public and devastating disasters is I have a book of ideas. I'm plagued with ideas. I have lots of ideas. And I would go and look at my book of ideas and see what excited me and I start thinking about what's next. And and so that kind of helped you get past the The only way the my sting. brain works is in Did you did you have any doubt in yourself as far as saying, you know, maybe I shouldn't be doing this, or it, it intermittently, yeah, and it it's um, and sometimes, um, but then I see somebody like it's funny when we talk about people. Somebody can look at you and and you're so smart. It can be intimidating where you go. Well, of course Roland's going to do great. He knows all this. He has all these contacts and and but who's really inspiring to me is I meet guys that are not sharp at all, but they know their basics and they just execute and they do it right. Yeah. And that inspired me, I'm like, okay. They will frequently be more successful than the smart person. And it's, and it's like, okay, don't outsmart myself. Play, you know, play to the basics, do yeah. the right things. Um, and so managing your own thinking and protecting your soul um, there's been a few events that that challenge me, and I have to think. Wait a minute! I know who I am. I know what my intent is. I know what my capabilities are, and I'm not going away. Do you have um, takeaways from those? Because I imagine you reflected on each of the ones, each of the things that wasn't successful. Do Do you have kind of a a few things that you really took away from that that you think made a difference as you went forward to deal number six? Without a doubt, the, the, the company Talk To Technology that we raised $75 million for, at one point Hewlett Packard was fighting with Sun Microsystems over who was going to invest in the company. Right. 
I mean, it was a very heady time. And we had this big knock in, in Salt Lake City that could have handled gazillions of customers. I mean, at that time we had more storage than Yahoo had, and this is when Yahoo was in it. Yahoo was in its heyday, and would, we took a picture of it, and some, and for a magazine ad, and some geek pointed out all our lights were off on our system. They weren't running because we had no customers. So this was back in the day when we would all launch products in stealth mode. You can't let anybody find out, or somebody will steal your internet idea. Right. And, and then you scale ahead of demand. But, and uh, ahead of assumed demand. You know, right. and, this, and we found out there was really no demand. And so now the learns, you know, learning that's come on, uh, lean startup, you know, uh, minimum viable product, these are the um, critical things like, and that I want to iterate with the customer and see if what I'm doing has any value and right. no longer betting the farm on my gut instinct. Uh, I had a mentor that used to use the line, it's not just can we, but should we? And that's one of my business criteria. Yes, I can do this, but should I? Is right. it, does it align with what I'm supposed to be doing? Anything else from that, that series of post-mortem um, examination? And, gosh, the, my only value is, is, is my failures, my mm -hmm. successes, I haven't learned that much from. I, I just want them to continue. But even something as simple as one of my biggest lessons is to always pay your withholding tax. <laughs> That's a good one. It, it, so you, it, you, <laughs> that is not your money. Do not finance your business with the government's and money. And I financed one of my businesses with the government's money, and I found out you know, after I paid that all back personally. <laughs> um, and so literally when I look at businesses and sometimes people have businesses for sale, the first thing I always ask. How's uh, your taxes? Yeah, how, and How's it's funny. And you watch people start hemming and hawing. And it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not uncommon for entrepreneurs to, well, we can't make payroll, but we've got 300,000 sitting in this account. Yeah. That's our tax money. And right. it seems like, um, don't do it. So yeah. you, you learn some really harsh practical stuff as well as some philosophical things that uh, um, the, the, the don't give up. Um, when the world doesn't believe in you, um, it, you know, they're not supposed to. We have to demonstrate this. So number six after the five was what? Um, and six in, in, in you say you had the five failures in a row, you said. What, what was the project number six? Um, so it's funny. I um, I literally I, I drove a business off a cliff. I started a, a a group on knockoff very early, and it was very successful. And then at the same time, Groupon crashed. So did we. Yeah. So the whole coupon right as deals. our uh, deal as our customers discovered. Wait a minute. I can't eat 47 half price pizzas in one month. Right. And it just like the whole world woke up and it just died. And I thought, well, I can always go make a film. And I was literally going to do a film while I, this is in 2011, while I figured out what to do next. And I went to my chiropractor and he goes, you ought to do something about the Wilk case. I'm like, well, what is the Wilk case? So apparently the AMA um, had a secret campaign in the 60s to discredit chiropractors. And they called it the Committee on Quackery. It used to be the Committee on Chiropractic. <laughs> and in 1974, um, five chiropractors sued the AMA. And it took 13 years, but in 1987, the AMA was found guilty of conspiring to contain and eliminate the chiropractic profession. So they were vindicated. Nobody ever heard about it. Uh -huh. And so I looked at the case and thought, well, it'd be an interesting Thing for this is what's happening to natural medicine now and sometimes happens to natural medicine. And so I went back and, and decided I was going to do that film. I did some research and so I made a film called Doctored and we sold 200,000 copies of that DVD to chiropractors who would buy it for $10 a piece wholesale because they wanted it out there. Huh. So that strictly to help the profession, help their business, right? So it, rehabilitate it's in the, their. So this is what I'm talking about about not growing under your own 
power, but now I'm not tapping into. Yeah. So here I'm not a chiropractor. In 2012, I was chiropractic person of the year. <laughs> it, 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 so in in 2004, um, I made a movie that was a response to Michael Moore's movie Fahrenheit 9/11. Uh, uh -huh. I made Fahrenheit 9/11, uh -huh. and it, it was financed by mostly Democrats. It was a marketing exercise. I knew there was a vacuum in the market. And so we got it out there. Uh, I spent 515000 making it. The day I finished it, Patrick Byrne at Overstock uh, called me and asked me to come show it to him. And he uh, offered me $2.3 million to buy it. And I'd already gotten it into Walmart. And the... Um, so we agreed on the price, and then we start talking. He goes, you're not rich anymore. And I said, no. And he goes, you're not even a millionaire. And I said, no. And he said, well, how much of this do you get? And I figured it out, and it was like 850000 He said, how much would I have to pay for you to walk out the door a millionaire? And it was $2.6 million. So he raised the price from $2.3 million to <laughs> $2.6 million. Wow. So I would walk out the door that day a millionaire. That's pretty cool. So I, I'm a huge Patrick Byrne fan. I bet. He's, he's a controversial guy, yeah. and I am in his corner forever. Yeah. That's really cool. Nice. That's awesome. And so then from then, you just did more projects like that, then, right? Then did more like that. Okay. So is there a way to kind of sidestep in your business into one of these things, um, like like a, a, a non-controversial business. Um, and I guess you can find controversy almost anywhere. I was gonna say like Starbucks, but then you can say, you know, well, they're right. putting the little person out of business and then right. what about fair trade and all, you know, they're not paying their employees enough and all kinds of stuff. I was trying to think of a non-interesting business, um, but is, is that like, do, you have businesses that come to you and say, I'd like to make a, a docu-series, right? Yeah, well, sort of, because I, I only part, I'm only a principal. Like, I'm not for hire, so I right. won't yeah, go I make a, a... And so I look for, for partnerships. We reached a point in, in our business at Revealed Films where we've maxed out the amount of work that I can currently do. Uh -huh. And so now i've got robert redford's daughter amy she's directing a series for me on cancer um, i'm now having to let go of of things and and but the way we're really going to grow is through partnerships yeah and so we're doing with some financial newsletter companies we're doing um, a couple of series um, and that's a, a particularly ripe area people want we didn't get a financial education, most of us going through school, uh -huh. and guys are reaching retirement age and still don't know much about how to manage their money. Yeah. And so we're filling that niche and I'm doing it with a lot of partnerships. If somebody is looking at this and thinking this would be a great way for them to ex expose what they're doing, I would just urge them, make sure that other people wanna see this. I didn't make a film about chiropractic because I wanted to promote chiropractic. Right. I made the film about chiropractic because I knew they did. And so it's looking for, I, my first question is who else benefits yeah. and how can I align with them so they benefit? Absolutely, that's great. So um, what did I not ask you that you think I should have asked? Well, usually I get asked for sex tips, but uh -huh. okay, I made that up. Yeah. I, I can't. No. Well, back you that and up I talk about that like all the time, you know, <laughs> late at night. But <laughs> no, um, I, this, the single most important piece of advice is it's not just can you, but should you. Yeah. I like literally that would have stopped Enron. Yeah. Uh, would have stopped me from some of the things that I did that yeah. um, that you know didn't work out. It's not just can we do this, but should we. I love it. Well, thank you so much for being on uh, today. If people want to get a hold of you or find out more about you, your projects, your movies, all that kind of stuff, what, what's the best ways for them to do that? So I'm Jeff at jeffhayesfilms.com. And Hayes is H-A-Y-E-S? No E in it. No, H-A-Y-S. Okay, H-A-Y-S. And then my website, jeffhayesfilms.com. Okay, what about social media and that kind of stuff? You doing that? Oh, I'm the worst. I've, I've got a personal Facebook page okay. with, <laughs> with 5,000 friends and, that, and, and beyond that. I'm out. All right. Fair enough. Well, thanks again. I really appreciate you taking My the time. My pleasure, Roland. Thank you.